This one's got four bits, the same as the other. Um, I'm just going to do one. I think we've got the climate variability stuff sorted. Um, but I do want to pass one piece on. I want to talk about the aquifers that are in this area, and particularly the ones that you know, potentially we may rely on. I'm going to introduce the desalination, and Anthony's going to take it from there um, and give you uh, more of the technology side. Um, but we've been through a real interesting period of about 25, 30 people have got desal across this last 18 months, and uh, we're really profiting from that early learning um, that's coming out of the back of that. You know, my message really is plan for dry conditions. Um, and if you know the Water Corps logo, and I don't know, Anthony, you hope it still is, <laughs> it's water forever, whatever the weather. And I think the thing that desalination gives us is, you know, water forever, whatever that solidity. And I, and I think that's, that's a really big opportunity that is coming. I'm not saying it is here yet, but we're not far away. All right, I made the point before about just saying it's getting drier, and I made a point of saying that it's going to get drier. And I, and I look, I don't like these sort of doom and gloom pictures, but I, I put it up just to say that the southwest corner um, is the only place in Australia, well, not the only place, but is the worst place in Australia in terms of the forecasts for climate change. Um, and you've got to know it. I mean, Okay, it's a horrible thing to talk about, but I'd be not doing my job if I didn't talk about it. Um, so, median is the future um, of an average climate. So, essentially, SIRO and all sorts of other people take the climate data from around the world, run through models, and make forecasts. And no idea whether this one's right, but it is the forecast. And it's for a two degree change. Um, this is the worst case at the 10th percentile, 90th percentile, and the median. The west coast of Western Australia, that's a 73% reduction in runoff. That's not rainfall. Remember I said runoff was <coughs> three units worse than rainfall. So that's, that's rainfall down, but runoff a long way down. Um, median 54% and best case 20, you know, or 90th percentile 20. So that's why I said water forever, whatever the salinity, and why I'm talking about groundwater. So, context. This looks like it's been done because we shut the borders. So, alright, so we're in the box there. This is the Yilgarn block. It's a piece of geology that we sit, sit on. It's the hunger granite that we know. Goes, you know, way up to the, up to the um, Pilbara. I think you get the idea. Um, and that piece of rock is an area of interest for exploration. Um, and even the miners are coming back into the work belt, which will be really good for us because they'll do the exploration that, you know, is expensive exploration, we hope. These little things that are lines running across it are interesting pieces of geology, which I'll get to. But I, I just want to start with this Mythbuster um, concept. And yeah, a really uh, uh, adventurous geologist in 1896 went out to Kalgoorlie when. You know, the big drought was on, they were um, boiling, you know, they had the water in the wood lines and they were distilling water and all the rest of it. And believed that there was an artesian basin under the granites. And after two years of drilling with a hammer tool, uh, 900 metres, they got a small flow at 36 metres. So the message is there is nothing down there other than hard rock. And the other subliminal message is here is that the water's going to be shallow. You know, the water that's going to be useful is going to be shallow. Um, and that was two years in a lot of money. But that wasn't the only um, drilling exercise done, and I'll show you in a minute. So in this country, we have um, four or five water resource targets when we're talking under the ground. We've got the weathered bedrock just above the ground, which is our number one target anywhere in the lead belt. And it looks like that. Um, that's just a sample that came out just before the drilling rig hit the rock. And it's big hunks of fresh rock ground up by the drilling rig. So it doesn't look like sand in the ground, but it looks like that when a drilling rig is attacked it. And that is number one target for just about everywhere except Darwin Line and Bosqueville. Um, Soaks, and I think you understand that, I don't know how to explain that. Sand is more an issue out the wheat, out the wheat belt. And hard rock is where we're going to go and have a conversation in a minute. And then we talked about 
the Monday channels on the south coast, that's a different story. But broken ground is where you all want to go, um, then it's a matter of quality. So I said there were two joint programs of interest, um, not the 1896 one, but this one done in 68, 70, which was up until recently um, renowned as, uh, as a significant drought in the state, way before we had you know, a big reduction in rainfall. They drilled two and a half thousand holes and 70,000 metres and an average of 30 metres. You can read faster than me about the number of farm dams and whatever. And the success rate was 263. So the success rate was 10%. So if you know nothing more about the wheat belt than basically going out there, this was geologists who hopefully they knew something, um, although their tools back in 68 perhaps weren't as good as now, but you know, things haven't changed a hell of a lot. Um, they got 21 kilolitres a day, or 21,000 litres a day is the average, and only 10% successful. And look at the criteria for success. A thousand gallons back in the 1970s when they weren't spraying, you know, and there were probably a lot less animals to feed and farms were a lot smaller, etc. There were 13% wet insufficient, 17% wet sailor, and 60% abandoned. And it's actually this number and that number that has changed hugely in 50 years. Okay, so, you know, we're all, we're all part of the wheat belt clearing story, at least a lot of us were. Um, I was doing farm plans in the eastern wheat belt. Um, this is my first job, and, you know, you have a bargain with a farmer that you could put 70% if you left 30%. Um, it didn't always work out that way. Uh, and we've, met, we've cleared 15 million hectares, but, and the iron and the and the consequence of that is every patch of salt that's in the wheat belt now. It's, that's the water that's going into the ground and it's coming out of the ground. But think that in a reverse sense. Um, rising water tables is putting 1,000 gigalitres into the wheat belt, and that's the lowest number that I can come up with um, every year. So we are building a water's resource under our farming systems. It causes salt, but maybe, maybe the flip side of that is a water resource. So, same area of land, but here's three bores that we've been monitoring in the district. Um, these are probably a bit further west than here. Um, the bottom one is um, uh, just the, uh, west of Juneau. So when we started monitoring in 1994, the water table was 17 metres down. The water table now is 4 to 5 metres down. So we, we've laid, what was that, 10, 12 metres of water in there. This one is a quality out, and we've added 10 litres of water, and that's now flatlining, it's full. And in the bush, remember I said climate change and bush, it's actually falling. So we know that if this was bush, we'd have falling water tables, but we've got farming, we've got rising water tables. What can we do with that increasing resource? Because that's what we're doing, it's what we call salinity, we've actually created water. And so that's why the optimistic optimism in me after 30 years of chasing salt around this landscape, is maybe there actually might be a, a silver mine. Um, and we know it just doesn't go in annually. We know that when you get this sort of flooding, you know, how many, every, it used to be every 11 years we used to get floods. It was 55, 64, 73, 83, 92, someone catch up. Um, um, and, and this is often where the, where the groundwater is formed. Okay, so I want to go and just talk about R&D and Hard Rock, and I've been talking to a couple of you out, outdoors about this. And this relates to desalination in a way that I'll make clear in a minute. Um, we were trying to work out a way of burying the product of desalination machines, which is the rigid water. Um, and one of the ways we thought to do that is actually to go and bury it in the hard rock. Um, so you've got desaline from the Gretty, the Gretty Aquifer at 36 metres, as per that hole, um, and we're putting this in a hard rock at 74 metres. But in the process of doing this, this is a rig at York in June um, at 74 metres and making 10 litres a second. So that's 500,000 litres, 8 litres a second, so 500,000 litres a day, and that's been pumping continuously. So there are interesting stories that in the rock 
The, the really opposite end of that scale, and this is at 360 metres, um, is a Merritt. And that's a fracture um, sitting under the Merritt town site. That's 50,000 parts per minute. So you know, that's one and a half times seawater, so we really don't want that sort of fracture. But that one is reputedly producing 50 litres a second. And they only pumped it for a month, because you know, it ended up being a river, but parts of a month. Um, and, and so this is what, and the last decade of being away from the wheat belt being the Kimberleys and other places, um, I've heard of another dozen plus drill holes drilled into the bedrock. So what is it about drilling above the rock and into the rock that might be a target? And I made it clear at the top of the last slide that this is, this is R&D and this is a place that you can probably share your, your back pocket with us if you want to, but um, it's probably a place where I think the public, you know, purse can probably go to get the system a bit further down the track. So this is a patch of country from Lake King to Lake Grace, just was the slide I used last time. And if you've got a power hose and a few bulldozers um, and you shifted everything off the rock down to 30 or 40 metres, it doesn't look this colour, um, but this is the geology that laying in the bedrock. So it's got nothing to do with the soil and the rock down to 30, 40 metres. This is the geology of the stuff underneath. And you can see these large dolerite dikes running all the way out to Woodgy Milther. Um, you can see bands of more magnetic rock, and you can see some you know, interesting little patches of geology which miners have played around with. And occasionally you can see these north-south lines running through there. So in the process of doing this desal work and trying to find how to reject water, we went to two sites that existed. Um, on the Lake Rose Road just out of um, Newgate and just a bit further south. And these two guys are actually brothers. Um, told me that they've got laws that do a litre a second. And if you remember back from the early 70s drilling, um, 21 kilolitres, so these are 86 kilolitre holes, they're unusual. Why are they unusual? And these aren't drilled into the rock. So these are 40 metre holes, 35 metre holes drilled to the top of the rock. But they make a lot of water. And is it just coincidence that they sit on a fault? Well, I don't think so. <coughs> Excuse me. This is another fault at a guy's place at Benjamin. And the only reason we went there is again, we were trying to figure out where we could help this farmer work out where to put the desalinated water. So here are the two case studies. <coughs> this is the side of Newgate. That's a desalinator. That's a power unit, no power. That's the, that's the tank um, for the water supply, the desalination machine, and that's the place where the guys are pumping. So they're pumping 20 kilolitres a day is distilled water, if you like. They're putting 50 kilolitres to reject. And in this particular case, the intake water is 26,000 parts, so that's two thirds seawater. That is right up on the top of the lane, the range that we're thinking about for desalination at the moment because brackish water plants are so much more effective and costly, cost effective, whereas deep, uh, salt units are more so, and, and Anthony will go through that. But this is the guy on this other fault, and he was putting, he's taking 70 kilolitres of water out of distilled water, so that's, his, that's what his unit's producing. And this is a really interesting desalinator. This desalinator is down the hole. It's in a 10-inch bore, and the desalinator lives under the water table um, with, a, with a submersible basically bolted to it. It is producing 70 kilolitres a day. It's rejecting 120 kilolitres a day, so that is 8620 tonnes of water a day. Okay. Um, and I couldn't figure out where the salt was going uh, because the bores, the monitoring bores, made no sense. So we went 40, 50 metres into the rock and we were getting two to five litres a second out of the rock. Um, and I figured out that's where the salt was going. It's going into the basin in fractures. So just two case studies, <coughs> slightly different. This is a guy that's used, or well, luckily, um, somehow figured out that the fault was more permeable. Didn't know that actually, he just got lucky. Um, and this is a guy that got just as lucky um, uh, for supplying 9,000 pigs. So, when we talk about these systems, this is not just about sheep in open paddocks. A lot of this story is about communities and industries. And 
way, way back when I was, um, didn't have grey hair and we were working here in the 1990s, um, we worked on these two faults and the solidity in the tower end catchment, and I met many of you way back in 30 years ago. Um, and we did a piece of work with a, a student and looked at the permeability in these two faults. And what we found is the permeability in the faults were two to five times what they were in the country that wasn't faulted. And the dead giveaway is that there were big, huge patches of salinity in the valleys below these faults. So they were acting like big drains. And this wasn't about below the rock, this was about above the rock. Okay, so the message from that is the target for just about every drill hole that goes into this country and I'll, I'll pick it up in a minute later. Um, but your first target is above the rock. Always is above the rock because that's where the volume of water is. The only reason you go into the rock is that, that above the rock supply is giving you enough water uh, and you need a lot more. That's the only reason you go to. Um, however, in this area, um, we, are, you know, we do have some amazing channel features. The both the polio channel that comes in from East of Asia and the darkened polio channel that crosses the Arthur, um, crosses the Albany Highway north of Arthur River. Um, and we've mapped um, us and Dewar have mapped two pieces of that. And the question outside was what does it look like? Well it's an old riverbed that was cut down into the rock. And, and you can actually see from the geology here that the river cut its way down into the granites. And we're talking 60 million years ago, so it's no no young river. Um, and the sediments that are dropped there and there are the sands and the materials over the top are clays. Um, but they are what any industry at Beaufort is going to be built on. Um, and potentially that's what, well, that's what the tannery was built on. Um, and they're not that rare. Um, they're rare to be fresh. Uh, they're not that rare to be ge geological. So how are they found? Um, obviously some of you guys had experience in drilling in this area and knew the language of pipe clay is, is well known in your lexicon um, and occasionally people talked about drilling sands and that, that was not um, far, far off. So I got involved in airborne geophysics a long time ago and I asked this company called Skytem, who were the first helicopter company to fly airborne electromagnetics to do a test at, um, at Dardanon. And this is the system, it's got a big coil and it's got transmitters and receivers and that helicopter picks it up and it flies back and forth across that survey. And what this map is, is after the survey was flown, the, the old riverbed running through to the Coalfields Highway um, west of Arthur River and crossing the Albany Highway north of Arthur River and Arthur Rivers down there somewhere. And the blue areas, I said, look to the guys, you know, I'll, I'll pick the sites, you drill the holes. So five holes I think were drilled, um, and I'm going back to 10, 15 years maybe. Um, and there's the coal, the really poor form of nights, and the sands are typically underneath that. There's the white pipe clays, um, and there's the aquifer sitting at, at, you know, down at the bottom underneath that. And they typically make two, the best of the holes make 10 litres a second, and some of the tannery type holes and others like that get up to that. They can be 500 milligrams per litre, typically they can get up to 3,000, but that number does all your sheep. You know, there's, they're, they're, all, they're all well under that. So from a community water resource, I think um, Tracy's going to mention one of those, I think that, um, that was on uh, Media at West Road, and there's a few others around the place down at Gordon Road and, uh, and others. But these are not that common um, in the sense that they only occur if you're on that shape. Um, and the particular issue is that they're not always fresh. You can see here at Saline, and that's typically where a creek comes in or a Saline valley comes in and pollutes it. So these are fantastic low salinity water supplies today. They are probably desalination targets in 20 to 50 years, depending on how much use they get made of them. But if you've got one of these, you've got gold. They are not an irrigation target. They go near it with an irrigator um, because of the quality issues, but they are an amazing stock and potentially feedlot and related resource. 
All right, so the question that everyone asked is how do I know I've got one and how do, they, how do I decide where to draw a hole? Well, you know, you go statistically, you've got a one in five chance of getting way back that amount of water. Um, and the reality of that was probably more like one in 25 in some of those shallows. So um, it's a high risk to get good water. So there are, there, are, there are four or five places to get water information. There's the water information reporting site, which I'll show you in a minute. We've got our research walls on there, but really that's, that's about salinity and trends. That's, um, we don't publish a lot of the, the details of those walls, although you can ring us up and find out that information. The geological survey has got online data, um, and you can go there. Um, there are consultants out there, but they're typically used to mining industry, not to agriculture. So, and there are people that do geophysics, and Paul and Rockley um, had a go at one of those just recently. Um, and I think it's still early days from the R&D perspective. Um, if you've got the geophysics, that's great. And I think as a state, we could probably do a bit more of that, particularly where we know these water resources are. And then you've got some really clear planning, and we've actually sought funds to do the Boscobel um, area, and we've sought early funding interest to do the whole of the South Coast. Local drillers are a really good source of information. Um, they carry a lot of history, um, but typically they don't last that long um, in any district. Uh, there was a company called Goldfields, I was just talking outside about, that used to park the back of the rig. Their motto was they park the back of the rig on hard rock at the top of the hill, and they go drilling. Um, and there are holes around here, out uh, of the 30 or 40 that they drill, there's probably a half a dozen that I know of that are supplying farms still. Um, so it is an option. And I'll talk a bit about why. So this is the Department of Water's database. Sadly, though, it's every hole that ever was drilled and a lot that wasn't. <laughs> um, so you've got to trawl a hell of a lot of information to get a whole record that is useful, but it's better than starting from scratch. And you just go into that and you know, squeeze into your area and see if someone drilled a hole before you build the farm. Um, our database is on the net, um, and you can put it on your phone, um, and you can navigate. You've got GPS systems in it, um, and that's just our monitoring network. Uh, we've also got the records of where the lots are rising for them. But the one that's probably of interest to you is this site called GeoView, um, and I think I've recommended a few of you have a go at it. It's not easy to use, uh, and it does require a bit of knowledge to figure out what the hell all this stuff on the end means. But if you want the magnetics map, which is the bedrock, then you go to here and I can help you with that. Um, or uh, you, you, ask, um, you ask me, and I'm at the moment I'm happy to do it, um, you know, like spend an hour here, because I'm still trying to figure out myself some of the stories behind this geology. All right, I'm pretty much finished, but um, so we know what dry dams, carded water, and port groundwater targets has cost us. Um, we, I think we've learned here that bores and key dams and road catchments uh, are the way we start down this path. But what we're hoping to do under something called Water Smart Farms, which was uh, voted on at Coolan, and it's the Commonwealth investment in all the states with a, uh, a drought fund. What we'd like to do with that drought fund is look for exploration in the rock and to get better targeting for groundwater supplies for you guys. Um, and the area that Anthony will now, will now talk about is, is desalination, which I think we're still calling last resort in the sense that there are probably a lot of cheaper water supplies. But the fact that 30 people ran out of water last summer um, and it was the only way they could get through, so you know, there are some really desperate people chasing water. So last thing, drilling do's and don'ts, just if you're going to get a rig in. This is a bit more to the west, but sand plain and outcrops, stay away from heavy country, stay away from blue gum valleys, stay away from white gum. Go about a third of the way down the ridge and stick away from the salt, that's pretty obvious. As shallow as possible, and you need at least 10 metres of drawdown in that hole, otherwise you don't have the water supply. Into that granite gritty stuff that I showed you on about the third slide, that's your target. Hard whatever the driller says, um, and, uh, and sometimes a bit more. Um, I'm not being negative, but they see it on day one. Um, they don't see it after 30 days, after 60 days, after 100 days. 
and not many holes are used 24-7 uh, in the wheat belt. They're typically used seasonally. Um, the salinity will increase. Um, maybe not much if you're in a good sandy area, but typically it will increase. Uh, 10, 20, 30 percent, something like that. And develop a test. There is no point getting Anthony's uh, tools out there and spending $50,000 on a diesel unit, putting power on a site to figure out six months in the things run out of water. Uh -huh. um, and that has happened. So develop a test. The last one that's not there is the Soil Land Conservation Act is a mechanism to control the relationship between you and the state and you and your neighbours. You've got to get rid of the rejected water somewhere. We're trialling disposal into the rock, as you saw by those case studies, and you need a notice of intent from the Commissioner's Office and Buddy and Sessa here and can talk to you later about effective and um, environmentally cautious and careful disposal. And we can talk about that later, but if you do go and reject that water and uh, you do need a notice of intent to, to get rid of that solid water. So come and talk to us about that afterwards. Thanks very much.